There he is. Brother Judah and I met, I guess, about four or five, maybe longer than that now, brother, I don't know, several years ago. And just one of them deals where we just hit it off real good. I believe the Lord knit our hearts that we might be friends and worship together and serve together in the years to come. It's the first time he's been able to be with us. And uh, I've asked him specifically to preach a message I heard him preach, or at least portions of it, that has his testimony in it. I believe his testimony exhibits this theme of resolve about as much as anything I've ever heard. And I know it's... I know some of you are maybe thinking about the time, but listen, these people that traveled here and did all this, they didn't come just to stay a few minutes and go. And uh, I want him to preach from his heart, and I want you to listen from your heart. And I know a lot of work's been done. We thank God for it, but it's, it'd be foolish to think that it's all been done. And so please, if you would, listen to my friend, help him say amen every now and then when he's preaching, all right? It's his first time being with us. Brother Judy, you come first. Thank you. Love you, thank you. Love you too. Thank you. Boy, it's been good to be here already, hasn't it? And uh, it's been wonderful. They told me they did things a little differently in the South, and I don't know that I was expecting all that I've already experienced, and it's been good, especially Shiny. I mean, he's been great. Uh, Shiny made me a little uncomfortable, and to be honest, I feel like I need to call my wife and just explain some things, but uh, oh boy. My name is uh, Abdel Kareem Aisa Judah. Did that make you a little uncomfortable? <laughs> but uh, anyhow, uh, anyways, hey, we're, don't, don't let that scare you. We, uh, we're on your side, all right? At least I am. <laughs> but uh, I was in the hotel, and uh, I was just sitting there waiting to get picked up, and, and a lady came to me, and, and she's probably in here tonight. I'm sure she probably is, but, but she said, uh, where is she at? Okay. Oh, there she is, right up front. Good. She said, uh, she said are, you, are you preaching tonight? I said, yes. And she said, well, Brother Judah, she said, if you struggle, you just look at me. She said, and I can telepathically tell you what to say. <laughs> and I thought, man, I heard it was different down here, but I, I didn't know it was like that. And so if I struggle tonight, just hook me up. All right. Very good. Genesis chapter number 27 I know the hour is late, and uh, let's get right into the Bible. I do appreciate Brother Shirley. He's been a good friend, and I mean that. And it's, it's just been a blessing to get to know him over the years. One of the most genuine preachers I've ever met. And that's what attracted me to him right away. I just love the sincerity. And I don't want to mess anything up tonight that the Lord's already done. And so I'm going to just uh, get right into it. Before I left, one of our young men, I was in West Virginia for 13 years and had the time of my life there serving the Lord and moved up to Hammond last year and been there just over a year. And before I left, one of the young men came up to me and, and said, uh, Brother Judah, we know that you're going to preach this weekend. And I said, yes. And he said, I just want you to know that uh, me and some of my friends have been praying and fasting for you. I said, well, thank you. And I looked at him and I said, uh, I said, why? You know, why are you fasting? What are you praying for? And this is what he said. He said, Brother Judah, we're just praying that the Lord would use you to, to bring to those teenagers a little bit of what you've brought to us this last year. And I looked at him and I said, I didn't bring anything. It's, it's all the Lord. And I just hope that it's all the Lord tonight as I give my testimony. We're going to be preaching and, and talking about a man by the name of Jacob. If you've been in church any amount of time, then of course you know the story of Jacob. Jacob is an interesting man in the Bible. He's perhaps one of my favorite Bible characters. We won't go through all of it, but, but his journey to God was very interesting. Jacob, we know, was a, a manipulator. Genesis chapter number 26, we see him manipulating his older brother Esau, for the birthright. Jacob was a manipulator. His, his very name means deceiver. It means trickster. That's, that's who he was. That's how he rolled. Jacob was, was a lying manipulator. Jacob was the kind of guy who was willing to do just about anything to get what he wanted. Have you ever met somebody like that? Willing to do anything. In Genesis 27, where we're at, 
Uh, we see that he is there, and of course we see the, the plan that's been hatched up to steal the blessing from his brother. His father was about to give the blessing. He had already been robbed of the birthright, and, and he was about to give the blessing to his older brother Esau, and, and Jacob is there once again, that lying, manipulating Jacob. He's there once again to get the blessing. We see him standing in front of his own father Isaac. The Bible says that Isaac was old and that his eyes were dim. He had trouble seeing and, and Jacob is standing there and, and I just want to say this and it's not the message but, but at this point in Jacob's life it's all a show. It's all just a game. It's all just an act. He's, he's standing there and, and he's all dressed up. The Bible says that that Jacob was a smooth man and Esau was a hairy man. And so in order to appear like his brother Esau, he, he has these goat skins and he's attached it to the back of his neck and, and to his forearms, animal skins, because Jacob was a hairy man. Have you ever thought about that? How hairy was Jacob? I mean, I've met some hairy people in my life, but, but man, nowadays we would say that Jacob had a chemical imbalance. And uh, that's what we would say. But, but he's standing there lying, manipulating, in front of his own father. What kind of a person would do that? Look, if you would, at verse number 18 of Genesis 27. The Bible says, And he came unto his father, all dressed up. And he said, My father, and he said, Here am I, who art thou, my son? Hey, this is Jacob's chance, isn't it? Th this right here is Jacob's opportunity to, to come clean and to get honest with God. Standing in front of his own blind old father. Who art thou, my son? Oh, I've prayed that God would uh, ask that question to every person in this room tonight. Who art thou, my son? Jacob, instead of being honest, he tells two lies. Look at what he says in verse number 19. And Jacob said unto his father, he said, I am Esau, thy firstborn. And I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison that thy soul may bless me. Jacob tells two lies. He lied, number one, about who he was. Then he lied, number two, about what he was doing. He said, I am Esau, and I've done all that you've asked me to do. Hey, have you ever done that to God? Have you ever stood before your heavenly Father and, and, and honestly lied, lied about who you were and about what you were doing? I think we've all been there, and Jacob was certainly there. Jacob was more concerned about how he looked on the outside rather than who he was on the inside. And, and even in my own life, I find that to be true. Concerned about the appearance and, and how do I look to everybody else. And, and listen, you do understand that man looks on the outside, but it's God that looks on the heart. And, and Jacob should have been concerned about how he looked on the inside, but, but he wasn't. Jacob's a lying, manipulating thief. Willing to do anything to get what he want, wanted, only concerned about appearances. And, and here it is, he's, he's probably my favorite character in the Bible. You say, Brother Judah, how could that be? Brother Tony, who did you invite? You invited this Arab terrorist, he doesn't even understand the Bible. And uh, no, he, he's not my favorite character because of who he was. He's my favorite character because of who he became. Because of what his life represents. There was something that happened to Jacob. And don't miss this. Something significant. Something genuine. Something real. Something that, that completely went against the grain of, of his whole life of acting and, and putting on. And, and something significant happened to Jacob. Let's read about it in Genesis chapter number 32. By the way, this is 20 years later, 21 years later. That whole show, that whole act that, that he portrayed in front of his dad to steal that blessing, he gained the blessing on the outside, but, but 21 years later, we see a little different story with Jacob. 
Look at what the Bible says in verse number 24. The Bible says, and Jacob was left alone. By the way, young people, if you're ever going to have this moment in your life, if you're ever going to have this, this turning point in your life where, where Christianity and, and Jesus Christ, where, where it becomes real and it becomes yours, you're going to have to learn to be alone for a while. Jacob was left alone, the Bible says, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, look at this, except thou bless me. You know, I, I thought Jacob had the blessing already. Wasn't that the whole point of, of the act and the goat skins and, and the lie to his mom and dad to, to gain that blessing? Wasn't that the... See, Jacob realizes 21 years later that while he got something on the outside, he had nothing real and genuine on the inside. And 21 years later, he's wrestling all alone with God and he says, God, I, I need you to bless me. I want it to be real on the inside. And, and look at the question that he's asked. Look in verse number 27. And he said unto him, what is thy name? Who art thou, my son? The same question, the, the same test, if you will, that, that he lied about 21 years previously. He's, he's brought to this point. Who art thou, or what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. Look at verse number 30. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Jacob had what I like to call a night that changed his life forever. Jacob had a moment where where he reached up and, and God reached down and listen to me, he was never the same again. It was a night that completely changed everything about who he was and who he would become. And, and let me just ask you the question tonight, have you ever had a night like that? Have you ever had a night in your life that changed you forever? A night maybe where you reached up and, and God reached down and maybe you can't describe all that happened, but, but here's what you know. You've never been the same. Might as well have changed your name because you left that place a different person. A night that a turning point. That's the power of the God that we serve. A God who can make the dirty clean. A God who can make the lying man honest. A God who can make the weak strong. A night that changed his life forever. A God who can reach down and listen to me in a moment. In a moment. Change a man's life. Have you ever had a night that changed your life forever? A first-hand moment with God. We have plenty of informed teenagers that know all about God. Plenty of conformed teenagers who hold to every standard in the book. But we don't have a whole lot of transformed Teenagers, and that's what I'm praying will happen as a result of this meeting. I vividly remember preaching this message at a camp for the very first time, and a young man that I love, I actually reached him on my bus route that I had invested in. He was a football player there at our local high school. He listened to the message, and he came down and was at the altar for what seemed like forever. Big guy, his shoulders were shaking, he was heaving, he was crying at the altar, and and I started to wonder what was going on. A lot of people came to make decisions, but he just stayed there. When it was all said and done, he grabbed a card and he, he scribbled on that card and he handed it up to me, looking in my face with those eyes, those tears streaming down his eyes. And this is what the card said. I've never forgotten it. He said, Brother Judah, tonight I'm coming for real salvation. Capital R, capital E, capital A, capital L. Real stuff. Hey, a night that changed his life forever. Let me just say this about that young man. He's had many obstacles and many opportunities to quit, and, and that was years ago. But he graduated from his public school, and he went on to Bible college, and he's training to be a missionary in the Middle East right now. A night that changed his life forever. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to, 
bless the message as I preach about three nights that changed my life forever. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this crowd. I thank you for the comfort that I've received just by the mutual faith that I have felt in this place. Lord, I pray that you would be glorified tonight. I, I pray that uh, you would be high and lifted up. Lord, as my story is told and as the Bible is preached, I pray that it would be done just as you would want it to be done. Help me not to say anything that would displease you. Lord, help me to say everything that you would want me to say. God, I do pray that you would do what I cannot do. As I preach to the ear, Lord, may you preach to the heart. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A night that changed my life forever. Three nights that have changed my life forever. Number one is the night of salvation. And by the way, it starts there, doesn't it? The night of salvation was a night that changed my life forever. See, I'm from the old school. I am. And, and I don't apologize for saying this. It gets me in trouble every now and again. But, but I'm, just ha I'm from the old school that believes when a man gets saved, something about his life will change. I mean, there's going to be some evidence when a man repents and, and trusts God. Listen to me. If any man be in Christ, uh, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. And I'm not trying to get anyone tonight to doubt their salvation, but, but I will say this. Perhaps the reason the Christian life is so difficult for some of you is because you've been living it all by yourself. And it was never designed to be lived by yourself. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The night of salvation is a night that will change your life forever. I remember when I got saved, and it was a night that changed me. I'm a bus kid from Chicago. South side of Chicago, that's all I am. Went to church for the very first time. I knew nothing. I was playing football in the street and uh, just with my friends passing the football and some guys came around and, and uh, being there on the south side, they had, they had suits on and, and my first thought was, man, who's in trouble? <laughs> you know, uh, what, what's going on? I thought they were the police or something and, and they came and they wanted to throw the football with us and, and we played some fo football and when it was all over, uh, they pulled us aside and they said, hey, they said, tomorrow, this was on a Saturday, they said, tomorrow, uh, uh, we're going to have a bus here in this area, and if we have 30 on the bus, it was the second week of the bus route, the bus route had just started, he said, if we have 30 on the bus, he said, this guy is going to swallow a goldfish. I, I said, what? <laughs> they said, yeah, this guy right here, going to swallow a goldfish. I said, you mean like the cracker, the cracker? They said, no. I said, the real thing? Yeah. I said, uh-uh. And they said, oh, yeah, we're going to. Now, I said, hey, man, count me in. I'll be there. Now, I know what some of you are thinking right now. I do, Brother Judah. You should go to church for the right reasons. Well, listen, I agree with that. I went to church to see a man swallow a fish. But, but I do agree with that. I had never been to church before. Man, I got up early, rode that bus. Loved it all. I was a teenager. I was 14 years old. Got on that bus and wrote, sang all the songs. Man, I just got baptized into the bus ministry just right away, singing the Big Mouth song, and I won the Big Mouth contest. <laughs> Amen. And uh, I remember walking into Sunday school for the very first time, a church on the south side of Chicago, kind of a, what we would call like an uppity, like a high church type of an atmosphere. And, and I can remember walking into Sunday school, and, and I had on a, a Six Flags Great America t-shirt, a pair of blue jeans, and some purple Nike flight gym shoes. That's what, that's what I had on. And when I walked into the teen Sunday school room, man, my eyes were opened. And all the guys sat on this side, and, and they all had suits on. I mean, perfect, like suits. The full deal. And all the girls sat on this side, and they had, they had the big fluffy dresses, and I mean, the whole nine yards, the Sunday best. And I can remember walking in and just, just stopping and looking and thinking, I've heard about these people. They're, they're the Amish people that they told me about. And the Amish were so kind, they, they saved me a seat right up front. And I can remember walking through and just every eye on me and, and I kind of sat down in my seat and was a little nervous and, and I didn't know all the Amish traditions and I was a little nervous and uh, the Sunday school teacher came in, he was a youth pastor and, and he said, all right, he said, we are going to continue our Old Testament survey. I was lost right there, I had no idea what he was talking about. He said, but we are in the book of Judges. 
He said, who can name the first judge? And I'm sitting there thinking, the first judge, the first judge. I was pretty good in school and wanted to be able to answer the question. I'm thinking the first judge, Judge Judy. No, no, that's, that's not it. Judge Joe Brown. No, no, that's probably not it. And every hand went up, and he called on one young man. His name was Daniel Thomason. And, and Daniel, he said, Daniel, who was the first judge? And Daniel said, Othniel? And I remember looking like, huh? Who? Man, we went through this routine, and the second judge, and the third judge. And, and I was lost, man, completely lost. And, and after Sunday school, it was the habit of the teacher to take every visitor into his office and and I don't think there's anything wrong with that, and that's what we did. He asked if I would go with him, and, and he witnessed to me, shared the gospel with me. I was old enough to understand, and, and I, I understood what he was saying. Then he asked if I would uh, say a prayer, and, and I said yes. And I repeated a prayer after him, and when it was all over, he looked at me and he said, man, this is the greatest day of your life. And I thought, it's been a good day. It's been a real good day. He said, you just got saved. And he, he shook my hand. And I thought, man, that's great. He took me to the morning service, sat me on the front row. And when the morning service was all over, listen, we sang out of the hymnal. I was so new to church. I didn't even know how to read a hymnal. I'm reading it like a book, you know. I didn't even know that you had to drop down. And, and it was all foreign to me. But I loved the spirit and, and the preaching. And, and when it was all over, the pastor stood up and he had a card in his hand. And, and he said, uh, uh, Abdel Judah. Would you stand? And I stood up, sitting right over here. And he said, Adele's coming today, trusting Christ as his Savior. Let's give him a big hand. And, and everybody clapped. And I thought, man, that's great. That's, that's wonderful. Went back home. We had 28 on the bus. And all the little kids started to chant, eat the fish, eat the fish. And I was there 14 years old. I just got wrapped up in it. Eat the fish, eat the fish. And Brother Bill Smith, God bless him, he was my bus captain. He dangled that thing and, and swallowed it and everybody cheered. And then he looked at me and he said, I'll see you next Sunday. And I said, yes, sir, you'll see me next Sunday. And I was there next Sunday and kept going to church and, and uh, just loved everything about it. I remember they showed a, a movie to our youth group on the rapture. For the first time since going to church, something stirred inside of my heart. Something stirred and, and I had this thought that that if the rapture were to take place, that I would indeed be left behind. It was an old school movie called The Thief in the Night. At first we were making fun of it because it was filmed in the 70s. And you know how they dressed in the 70s? And, and we were laughing about it. But they kept singing this song about you'd be left behind. And, and man, by the end of it, I mean, the conviction of God was on my heart. That night, Daniel Thomason, the boy who knew all the answers, he got saved. He was a deacon's son. He got saved that night. Others got saved, and, 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 and God, I knew that, that God was speaking to me. I knew it. But isn't it incredible how quickly pride can set in? I mean, there I was. I'd only, I'm a bus kid, only been coming for a, for a few months, but the devil told the same lie to me that maybe he's telling to some of you tonight, but everybody thinks that you're saved. And that's what he was playing over and over in my mind. And, and I remember that night I refused. I knew I was lost but I refused to get saved. A few months later, an evangelist came in, and on a Monday night, he preached a message. Point number one, I know how I got here, and he preached on creation. Point number two, I know why I am here, and he talked about soul winning and witnessing, and point number three, I know where I'm going when I die. I'm going to heaven, and man, on point number three, I was gripping the pew. Everything inside of me, everything inside of me at the invitation said, you need to go forward and, and you need to trust Christ. But I stood there for just a few seconds longer than the invitation lasted. But man, when it was all done, I found that bus captain, Brother Bill Smith, a layman in the church who had invested in me. And, and I said, Brother Bill, I need to get saved. He said, really? I said, yes, I need to get saved. We went up into his office and I can take you to the spot there at Jordan Baptist Church on the south side of Chicago. I knew the plan of salvation for the most part. I, I knelt there uh, in his office. I put my left arm on top of a short filing cabinet. And that night, I trusted Christ as my Savior. And let me just say to you, friend, that, that I've never been the same since that night. Truly, the night of salvation is a night that will change your life forever. 
Something on the inside changed. Uh, something got a hold of my heart that night. And, and I've certainly not been perfect, but I can never get away from that night of salvation. It was a life-changing, first-hand moment with God. And it was so much more than saying a prayer and so much more than filling out a card. And, and listen, I knew it when I got it. Amen. Hey, do you have that? Do you have a moment where you reached up and, and God reached down and you got saved? That's a life-changing night. We've knelt at altars and our knees have been converted. We've said prayers and our mouths have been converted. We've given up worldly music and, and all of that and our ears have been converted. But understand something, church. The Bible says it's with the heart that man believeth unto righteousness. Our hearts need to be converted. A night that changed my life forever is the night of salvation. Secondly, there was another night that changed me. It was the night I surrendered to God. Happened that same summer at team camp. Because of my mom and dad's divorce, I, I didn't have the money to go to camp. And let me just be honest with you, I didn't want to go. I mean, I looked at these church kids and they were all dressed perfectly. And, and I just assumed in my mind that, that these kids never did anything wrong. God has let me be a youth pastor for 14 years now, and that's certainly not true. But regardless, uh, I just didn't want to go. I love the church. I loved my bus captain, but I, I didn't connect with the teenagers in the youth group. When the announcement was made, I just sort of resigned myself to not sign up and to not go. One by one, the teenagers signed up, and I didn't. The night before we were supposed to leave, my bus captain it was Sunday night, we were leaving on a Monday morning. My bus captain was giving me a ride home and he pulled off on the corner of 95th and Cicero Avenue. There's a Chevy dealership there, there's a White Castle there and he pulled off at that White Castle restaurant and, and he put it in park there in the parking lot and he said, uh, he said, Abdel, he said, uh, you know, we're going to camp tomorrow. I said, yes. He said, I've noticed that you haven't signed up. He said, you're going, aren't you? And man, those words, <laughs> you're going, aren't you? Just like the Holy Spirit dug those words in my, you're going, aren't you? And I said, Brother Bill, I'm not going. And I didn't want to go. I said, Brother Bill, I don't have the money to go. He said, oh, is that it? I said, yeah. Normally that throws him off the trail, you know. I said, yeah. He said, Abdel, you're never going to believe what happened tonight. I said, what? He said, somebody came up to me tonight after the service and they gave me just enough money to send somebody to camp. He said, Abdel, I have the money for you to go to camp. Now here's what I found out later. Nobody came up to Brother Bill. Uh, Brother Bill came up to Brother Bill and gave him the money. He, that, he was being a good bus captain. <laughs> hey, that's all right. A little lie works every now and then, right? But uh, I said, really? He said, yes. I said, Brother Bill, I said, I don't know. He said, look, and then, and then it got real serious. He said, Abdel, listen. He said, I know you don't want to go. He said, but if you'll go one time just for me. He said, if you don't like it, you never got to go back. But if you'll go one time just for me, I sure would appreciate it. I looked in the eyes of that layman who worked at the Chicago Tribune Company. I knew that he loved me. I knew he did. I said, Brother Bill, I'll go. I'll go just for you. He said, great. And then he started talking it up, you know, telling me how much fun I was going to have and how exciting it was going to be and drove me home. And by the time I got home, man, I was fired up. I was ready to go. I was ready to go to camp. I got into the house and, and I said, mom, I said, I'm going to camp. I said, you're never going to believe it. I'm going to camp tomorrow. She said, we don't have the money to send you to camp. I said, mom, you're never going to believe what happened. Somebody came up, and I told him the whole story, and, and I said, Mom, I said, I need to pack. We leave in the morning. I, I said, go get a suitcase. I need to pack. She said, okay, and she walked into the kitchen, and, and she went into the kitchen, and she was messing around, and, and she came out with, with, with this right here, and I was looking at it, and I, I said, Mom, what's, what's that? She said, we don't have any, any suitcases. She said, we're poor. She said, she said, just take one of these garbage bags. I thought, Mom... Uh, they already think I'm weird. And by the way, these are generic. They're not even the good ones. I mean, you, you, you went to the dollar store and you got these garbage bags. They're going to fall apart. I know it. And, and she said, son, she said, this is all that we have. I said, mom, there's got to be another way. And she said, let me, let me call grandpa. She said, maybe grandpa has a suitcase and, 
And, and, and she got on the phone, and I can remember really praying one of, the, one of the first genuine prayers after salvation. I'm sitting there watching my mom on the phone to Grandpa, and I'm praying, Lord, please, please help Grandpa to have a suitcase. I mean, surely somebody in my family has a suitcase. And, and please, Lord, you know my heart. I'll, I'll, I'll break into the neighbor's house. I'll steal his if I, if I have to, but I prefer not to. And, and she hung up, and she said, good news, Grandpa's got a suitcase Yes! Oh, yes! First answered prayer right there. Man, it was like the fireworks of heaven went off in my soul. I was thrilled that Grandpa had a suitcase. I said, Mom, go get it. I'm going to go pack, and, and I'll meet you here in the living room. She took off and, and got in the car, went to Grandpa's house. I went upstairs like every 14-year-old teenage boy, and I packed, which basically meant I just took my two arms and went to the center of the, li- of the floor, just went like that, and carried it down and uh, put it on the living room floor, floor. And I waited for my mom to come, and, and soon she came, and, and she opened up the door. She had something behind her. And I said, hey, Mom, you got the suitcase? She said, yeah, oh, yeah, uh-huh. Sure do. <laughs> I said, well, well Let's see it. Bring it. And, and, and she brought it out. And I'm looking at this thing. It was hot pink. It had a big yellow fluorescent dot right in the center of it. And I'm looking at that. And I'm thinking, what, what is that? And then I'm thinking, is there something I need to know about Grandpa? I mean, what is... What, what is he doing with this suitcase? Where did this thing come from? I said, Mom, what, what is it? She said, uh, she said, this is your suitcase. I said, Mom, it's pink. She said, oh, no, no, no. She said, this is red. I said, no, it's not, no. That's pink. All right, I know what that is. I, I preached this to our kids in Hammond, and, and my mom came to visit the church, and, and they flooded to her. All they wanted to know is, did he really have a pink suitcase? And my mom took great joy. She said, oh, yeah. She said, and it had a big yellow fluorescent dot right in the middle of it. And, uh, and I said, Mom, I can't take that to camp. Pink suitcase? She said, well, son, it's either, it's either the suitcase or the garbage bag. She said, this is, this is all that we have. I can remember looking. In the valley of decision, man, right there. And I'm looking at the pink suitcase and, and the garbage bags and the pink suitcase and the garbage. And I'm, I'm wrestling. And finally I said, hey, man, I'll take the suitcase. Grabbed that pink suitcase, packed it up. First thing, Monday morning, man, Brother Bill's there to pick me up. And, and, and we get to the church, and it was like the military. They lined us up against the cinder block wall, and we had to put our luggage right in front of us, you know. <laughs> And there's everybody, and they have their nice Nike bags and their leather luggage, and, and there I am, way at the end, you know, uh, <laughs> pink suitcase. <laughs> there it is. And you're not going to believe this, and I shouldn't say it. I really shouldn't say it, but, but I had a nickname back then. Now, don't you call me this, or else I'll get some of my cousins to blow up your car, all right? But uh, <laughs> I, I, I had a nickname, and my nickname, my mom gave it to me. I've since dropped it, but... <laughs> My nickname was Abby. That's a girl's name. I found that out in high school, all right? But there was Abby with his pink suitcase. We got on the bus there, and, and we drove to Koshkanag, Missouri. I'd never really been out of Chicago in my whole life, and we're driving now to Koshkanag, Missouri, 10-hour trip. For 10 hours, the teens sang songs that I had no idea the words to the songs. They, they played Bible trivia games, and I, I had no clue what the answers were. They even tried to be kind. They tried to include me. They, they threw me a softball. They, 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 they threw a question out there, and, and they said, who was the mother of Jesus? And they all looked at me like, surely he can get this. And I can remember just sitting there like, uh, and I'm just, I didn't know. I didn't know. I had one dress outfit for the entire week, one white shirt, one pair of dress pants, one tie, all week long. (laughs) Got pretty interesting. The last night, the preacher stood up. Thursday night, he said, tonight I'll preach this message, not for most of you, maybe for just one or two. I don't remember the whole message. I really don't. I, I don't remember much of it, but the invitation time came. And I can remember bowing my head and And it was like as soon as that invitation hit, God said, hey, I want you to do that. I I want you to do what you've seen this man, this preacher do all week long. I I want you to preach. And and I can remember 
for just a, I don't have one of those testimonies where I wrestled for a long time. I didn't wrestle for a long time. I, I had my plans and my dreams and, and I had a pretty good idea of what I would be doing in my life, but that night I surrendered to God. I can remember walking down the aisle and, and kneeling right over here and, and just praying, just saying, God, if you want me to do that, I'll do it. I don't know how I'll do it, but I'll do it if you want me to do that. The invitation lasted for a long time, and when it was all said and done, everybody, um, so many people came, and, and it was just one of those glorious invitations where we were hugging each other. Man, I was all in at this point. It's amazing how things change when you surrender your life to God. I mean, it's amazing how things change. These people who weren't my friends, these people who I was kind of distancing myself from, now I'm just, I'm one of the veterans, you know. I'm giving them a big hug, and I'm slobbering all over them, and uh, it, it was great. We sat, we sat right here, and we were on stairs, and we sang, I'm on the winning side at the end of the night. Sang it for probably uh, many stanzas, just sang it forever, and, and we were all there, and, and I had gotten pretty emotional that night. My pastor was here, and my youth pastor was here, and my pastor leaned over, and he said something to my youth pastor that I'm sure I wasn't supposed to hear, but he said this. He said, do you think he'll be around in two weeks talking about me? Because how many bus kids do we take to camp? How many times do we see decisions, and, and then they're not around in two weeks, but here's what they didn't know. That night, I reached up, and God reached down, and listen to me, that, that night of surrender, I've never been the same since that night. And I want to ask you the question tonight, teenager, do you have a night of surrender, a night where you gave it all to God, where there was nothing between your soul and the Savior? Not a boyfriend, not a girlfriend, not some internet stuff, not, I mean, listen, it was all his. We went to, a, we went to a, a bonfire afterwards. And I remember being around that bonfire, and they handed all of us a, a stick. And, and I, this is a common practice. I had never experienced it. But, but they said, tonight, the last night of camp, we're going we're gonna to give testimonies. And, and we want you to step forward when it's your time and, and tell us what decision you made this week. And, and then throw your stick in the fire and maybe give a prayer request. And, and that'll be your testimony. And, and I watched as all the young people did that. Somebody would stand up and they'd have their, their stick and, and they would say, this stick is, is my bad language. And I'm giving it to God. And they'd throw it in the fire. And another person would stand up and, and they'd say, and this, this stick is, is my attitude towards my mom and dad. And, and I got right and they threw it in the fire. And, and then it was my turn. When it was my turn, I didn't know what to say. I just said what came naturally. I had that stick and I, I held it up and I said, this stick is my whole life. And I threw it in the fire. And I said, and pray for my sister, Melissa. She's struggling and she's, she's not doing well. My sister had struggled with drugs for a long time and I said, she's not doing well, pray for her. And they all gathered around me and they prayed for my sister. And Boy, that night of surrender was a night that changed my life forever. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but listen, be ye transformed. You see, that, that surrender, once we're surrendered, we can be transformed. And that's exactly what had happened to me. I didn't even know that verse was in the Bible, but God whispered it in my soul. Everything changed. My friends, my music, my future, my mouth, all of it would become God's. The bus ride back. I was with Brian Fisher on the bus ride back. Man, we talked about serving God the whole ride home. I can remember pulling back into that church parking lot in that white Ford Taurus, Brother Bill, taking the morning off of work to pick me up. He was there, and I walked over to him, and I said, Brother Bill, had the, had the pink suitcase with me, proud of it now. <laughs> High-stepping, you know, hey, bless God. <laughs> this is a suitcase I got called to preach with. <laughs> and, uh, walked over to him, I said, Brother Bill, I said, you're never going to believe what happened. He said, Abdel, he said, I got something to tell you. He said, you're never going to believe what happened. I said, Brother Bill, me first. He said, no. He said, this is huge, me first. I said, Brother Bill, listen, this is you. And then I just, I just blurted it out. Already practicing the profession, I just blurted it out. 
I said, God's called me to preach. He said, whoa. That layman began to cry. He said, that's huge. I said, Brother Bill, what did you have to tell me? He said, well, Abdel, I figured last night, you know, it was your last night. And, and he said, I wanted to get by to see your mom. And, and so I went to the apartment there where you live, and I knocked on the door after work and hoping to catch your mom. He said, but your mom wasn't home. But your sister, Melissa, answered the door. He said, Melissa, let me in. And, and I sat on the couch with her, and I, I showed her how to get saved. And Melissa got saved last night. I said, really? I said, I said, I said, when? I said, huh? and we had figured out, I don't think the times were exact, but he knows what we had ne have need of before we even ask him. Right around the time, right around the time that we were praying, Brother Bill was there leading my sister to the Lord. My sister died last year, day after Christmas. Heroin overdose, she struggled her whole life. Let me tell you something I didn't regret. Throwing my stick in the fire. And you'll not regret giving your life to God. You'll not regret it now, and you'll not regret it later. As we all got around the hospital bed there, and I watched my mom give my sister a kiss before they unhooked the machines. And as I went over and gave her a kiss, I thought of that night years ago. The stick is my whole life. Amen. Young people, isn't that what you want? Isn't that what you're looking for? Isn't that why you're here? Not just to have fun and, and not just to play games, but, but aren't you looking for something substantive, something on the inside, something that is tangible, something that, that you can hold on to and that will hold on to you? Listen, you need to surrender to God. You won't regret it. It'll change you forever. It's so much more than, well, I've already made that decision. You've made that decision. Well, where are we at right now on that decision? Hey, is there nothing between your soul and the Savior? Because I'm going to tell you right now, if you want the kind of night I'm talking about, you give it all to God. You give it all to God. But Brother Gino, what about, hey, there are no what about. You give it all to God. You let him take care of the rest. It'll change you. There's a third night. A third night. And it's the night I learned to take a stand for Jesus Christ. The rest of that summer was filled with so much change. God began to clean everything up in my life. Everything. Music, friends. I started going to church Sunday nights, Wednesday nights regularly. I started going out soul winning and witnessing to other people and Towards the end of the summer, I heard my preacher preach, and, and he just made a, a, a casual statement. He said, he said, some of you are getting ready to go back to school, and you ought to carry your Bible to school. I just made a mental note. That's a good idea. That sounds right. I'm going to do that. I'm gonna, I just filed it in the back. I'm going I'm to carry my Bible to school. School time came around, and now you have to understand, I'm from a pretty rough neighborhood in Chicago. They, they say that the streets of Chicago right now are more dangerous than the streets of Afghanistan. And, and I don't know how true that is, but, but I do know it's pretty rough in some spots. And, and where I was living at the time was pretty rough. First time I ever saw a gun was in my public school. That I ever saw a gun that a police officer didn't have, uh, but I'm talking about. First time I ever saw it was in the backpack of a, of a kid, uh, the locker right next to me in the public school. There were gangs in school. Aladdin Kings were in school. The gangster disciples were in school. I can remember vividly just, just knowing that there were some colors you could not even wear to school. You could not wear black and yellow or black and gold. You, you could not wear black and dark blue. Uh, you, you just didn't, you avoided those colors because they were gang colors. And, and that was the kind of school that, that I was in. Drive-by shootings in the neighborhood. The year I'm talking about right now, the year I'm talking about, there were three drive-by shootings. One of them claimed a class member's life right there in the neighborhood, just in that one year. First day of school rolled around, and I had my Bible in my hand. I'd like to stand here tonight, I really would, and tell you that I was super strong, you know, super spiritual. 
but I absolutely wasn't. I got made fun of. They, they laughed at me. Called me Reverend Fudd because I got a weird laugh. Apparently, when I laugh, I laugh like this. <laughs> and so, so they called me Reverend Fudd. <laughs> Knocked the books out of my hands. And, and you can imagine, and it was the whole deal. At lunchtime, listen, at the public school, maybe it's different around here, and, and maybe it's different now in Chicago, I don't know, but back in the day, uh, they didn't have a whole lot of money to operate on. There was pretty much one edible thing at lunchtime, and that was the chocolate pudding. I happened to love chocolate pudding, and at lunchtime, uh, here's what they did. When I would bow my head to pray, every single time, every single time, like clockwork, when I would bow my head to pray, when I would open up my eyes, my chocolate, they'd steal my chocolate pudding and be gone. Now, you're supposed to, like... Go, aw, they'd steal it. Bunch of Chicago gangbangers. No, but uh, I was preaching this message, and a kid was making a decision. He, was looked, he's, he said, Brother Judah. I said, what is it? He said, Brother Judah. He said, I just have one question for you. I, I said, what is it, man? What is it? He said, in school, when they were stealing your pudding. I said, yes. He said, Brother Judah. He said, when you were praying. I said, yes. He said, why didn't you just put your hand on the pudding? I thought to myself, get out of here, you little dork. <laughs> that was ingenious. I never did do it, <laughs> but it was ingenious. <laughs> they found out that I was keeping myself pure until marriage. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. Amen. By the way, you know what? I think people ought to know that you're keeping yourself pure Amen. until marriage. Yes, they, they found that out. And that's all I want to say about that, because there were just filthy things done. Amen. There was some light at the end of the tunnel. Everybody had a, a favorite teacher. His name was Mr. Harris. He was the kind of teacher that was very excited about teaching. He seemed to have boundless energy. He loved to teach his class, and, and he really was the best. And, and he taught a, a history government type class. And, and I was getting ready to go into Mr. Harris's class. I can remember the first time I walked into the class, he had his classroom set up differently than all the other teachers. He had maybe 20 or 30 chairs on this side of the room and, and maybe 20 or 30 chairs on, on this side of the room, and then he had a stool right in the middle. And he would always wait for the students to enter the room, and when they all got situated, then he would come, literally, he did this every day, he would come running into the classroom. And he was an older guy, but he was spry. And, uh, but he would come running into the classroom, he would jump, he would land on that chair, and he would say, all right, we only got a few minutes to teach, let's get after it. And man, I remember that first day of class with Mr. Harris, there he was, he, he ran in, he jumped on that stool, and, and I thought, man, this is going to be great. Mr. Harris, he's the best. He said, we're going to start off with some debates and discussions in class for a couple of weeks. He, he said, the first topic that we're going to debate is gays in the military. Now, some of you remember back in the 90s, in the late 90s, that, that was a major topic. Everybody was talking about that. It's just a big time topic. And he said, how many of you think it's okay for gays to be in the military? About half the class raised their hand, roughly. He said, how many of you think it's wrong and you're against that? And about half the class raised their hand. I raised my hand. I was against that. And then he gave us his opinion. And oh, he was smart and he was educated and he was eloquent and, and he was very liberal and very much on the side that, that it's all good. When he got done giving his opinion, he said, now, how many of you think it's okay for gays to be in the military? And most of the class raised their hand. And, and he said, how many of you think it's wrong still? And and I raised my hand, I was the only one. Not trying to be the only one, but I was the only one. He looked, he, he said, Mr. Judah. He said, I'm surprised. He said, he said, why is it wrong for gays to be in the military? And I said, I said, well, Mr. Harris, I said, I'm a Christian. He took a step back. He said, well, I'm a Catholic myself. He said, Mr. Judah, he said, what's, what's the Bible say? about gays being in the military. What does the Bible say? I had no idea what the Bible said. I, I had heard my pastor repeat a statement and kind of a slam, kind of a derogatory statement. And, and I had heard him repeat it. And I thought that it was the Bible and honestly, in a, in a pure heart, not knowing. I said, well, Mr. Harris, the Bible says, and I, I gave him a smart aleck remark. And, oh, he bristled at that. And he just ripped me up one side and down the other, and, and, and it was bad. 
next day of school. We walk in and same deal, made fun of and chocolate pudding and same deal, pretty discouraged. By the way, that Bible that I had carried, you know, the first few weeks of school, now it was on the bottom stack, now it was getting left in the locker every now and then, but the damage was done. They, they knew who I was. I can remember the second day of Mr. Harris's class walking in and grabbing a seat, 20, 30 over here, 20, 30 over there, and the stool in the middle, and, and thinking to myself, well, this will be a better day. This will be a better day. He ran in, he jumped on his stool. He said, today we're going to talk about abortion. He said, how many of you think that abortion is wrong? About half the class raised their hand. I raised my hand. He said, how many of you think it's okay and it's a woman's right? And about half the class raised their hand. And then he gave his opinion. His opinion was very eloquent and very well-reasoned. And he went for a long time saying why it was okay. It's not murder. That's crazy. Uh, a, a child isn't a, a child until it exits the womb, and, and it's just a fetus. And he gave all these scenarios. He said, now how many of you think it's okay? Most of the class raised their hand. He said, how many of you still think it's wrong? I raised my hand. He said, Mr. Judah. He said, let me guess. He said, you're a, you're a Christian. I said, yes, I am. He said, Mr. Judah. He said, what does the Bible say? About abortion, I had no idea what the Bible said. And I can remember just looking at him and facing half of my classmates with him in the middle and, and just shaking my head and saying, I, I don't know. I don't know. By the way, young people, it is important to believe what the Bible says, but, but it's probably more important to know why you believe what the Bible says. We, we need to be people that live in the book. I didn't know. I didn't know. I said, I don't know. And he said, oh. He said, I see. He said, so you're just going to come to class day after day and force your opinion down everybody's throat. I said, no. And I hate to admit it, but I started to cry a little bit. And I remember slithering out of that class the next day of class. I walked in, had a rough day. Walked in, and when I walked in, the, the seating arrangement was a little different he had taken all the chairs on the right side of the class, all but one. He had put them on the left side. He would really crammed the left side, probably 40, maybe 50 chairs on the left side in his stool. And, and then there was one chair over here. I remember looking in and, and, and uh, just following everybody else and walking over here to the left side and grabbing a seat relatively in the middle. And Mr. Harris came bounding in. He jumped on that stool and he said, all right. He said, we're going to start class. He said, but before we do, before we do, where's Mr. Judah? And he found me and he said, Mr. Judah, before we start, let's just establish something. You're a Christian. He said, we have a seat for you right over here. He said, why don't you get up and just, since, since, since you have your opinions, since I'm sure we're going to have to hear about them. Listen, I, I didn't say anything. <laughs> I remember walking and, and sitting down. When I sat down facing the rest of my classmates, he he turned his body completely, his back to me, and he just taught the rest of the class. He didn't say anything. He just taught the rest of the class. And I just sat there. Everybody stared at me. I sat there, just cried. I can remember going home that day and thinking to myself, you know what, this is, this is pointless. Standing for God and living for God. And, and if this is what it's going to be, and, and if this is what is going to happen, I, I, I don't have to do this. Nobody's making me do this. Man, I talked myself on that, on that walk home from the public school. I, I talked myself into not going back to church and, and just kind of giving up on the whole thing. And, and that Bible that I had in my hand that I was carrying from school, I was, I was so enraged. I hate to tell this part of the story. The Lord knows I hate to tell this part of the story. But, but I got into my bedroom and closed the door and I took that Bible and I threw it across the room and it slammed up against the wall of my bedroom and tore one of the pages and dropped to the ground and I was done. Listen, I was done. Done. I was doing some homework that night. That night there was a knock on our little apartment door. My mom called. She said, Abby, she said, some men are here to see you. And I, 
I walked into the living room, and, and there they were. It was Brother Bill, my bus captain. It was Brother Griffin, my youth pastor. And it was my pastor, Jim Wing. They, they were all right there in the living room. And, and man, for, for the pastor to come to my house, I mean, that was, I just, that blew me away. I walked over to them. They were standing right inside of the door. And Pastor Wing looked at me, and this is what he said. He said, Abdel, he said, we just want you to know we're out making visits. He said, the three of us together, we just want you to know that we're proud of you. Amen. I thought to myself, you're proud of me. How, how could you be proud of me if you could have seen what I did just a few hours ago? If, I mean, the Bible was still laying on the floor. How could you be proud of me? He put his arm on me. He said, we know that you're trying. He said, we can tell. He said, we're proud of you. He prayed with me. It wasn't a long visit. They left the house and I walked back into my bedroom and I can remember just looking at that Bible. Yeah. Just confused. I thought about that night of salvation. I thought about that night at camp. And I walked over and I grabbed the Bible and I, I figured I'd give it one more chance and I knelt down at the foot of my bed, and I opened up the Bible to the most logical place. I opened it up to Genesis 1-1, just the first page. And I got to the first line, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I stopped right there. And I just prayed right there. It was just, I just stayed. I just prayed. I just stayed. I just, I just emptied myself out. I said, God, I'm sorry. I've tried, and, and I failed, and I'm sorry. And God, I'm sorry I threw this book against the wall, and, and I'm sorry that I've, I have failed, but God, if you'll give me a second chance. And, and I just stayed a long time. I can't describe all that happened that night. I believe that night I was filled with the Spirit of God from the very first time as I stayed, and, and literally something else happened inside of my heart. When I was done praying, I was starving to death. I mean, I was hungry. You ever been there, pray for a long time, you're just hungry. And it was late at night. There was only one restaurant open at the time. It was a White Castle. Any, anybody here know what White Castle is? Praise the Lord. Hey, that's good stuff. Real good. And uh, they were open 24 hours. Had one right across the street from the house. And I can remember uh, holding on to that Bible still and, and walking over to the White Castle to get something to eat late night. And I walked into that White Castle. And, and when I walked into the White Castle, uh, I stood in line. There was a line. And and right in front of me was somebody from the school, somebody that everybody knew. His first name was Irvano, but that's irrelevant. We called him Bones. That's what everybody called him, Bones. That was his name. Bones was the leader of the Latin Kings in our school. A big guy. He turned around, he looked at me, and he said, hey, in line, White Castle. He said, hey. He said, I know you. And I thought, man, I know you too. <laughs> Everybody knows you. And then he said this. He said, hey, what that teacher's doing to you, man. So that's not right. He said, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing good. I said, how are you doing, Bones? <laughs> he said, I'm not doing good. He said, my brother's in St. Francis Hospital, which was right around the corner. He said, he said, he's been shot. I don't know if he's going to make it. I said, Bones, is he going to go to heaven when he dies? He said, I don't know. I said, Bones, what about you? He said, are you going to go to heaven when you die? He said, I, I, I don't know. He said, I don't think so. I said, Bones, can I? I had my Bible the gift Bible that the bus captain had bought me. I said, Bones, can I show you how to go to heaven? He said, yeah, we stepped out of line. And Bones had those tattoos, those tattooed teardrops. You know, you ever see that, three or four tattoos? I never knew what it meant. And somebody later told me that, that if a gang member has tattooed teardrops, if, if they're filled in, that each teardrop is somebody who has been killed in the gang. And if they're filled in, then the gang got revenge. And if they're empty, then they're still seeking revenge on that death. I, I didn't know all of that, but he had those teardrops on his eyes. And, and I'll never forget stepping out of line at the White Castle and, and taking that Bible. 
and showing bones how to be saved point by point, just like I had been taught. Came time to get saved. I said, Bones, I said, do you understand all that? He said, I do. I said, Bones, do you want to ask the Lord into your heart right now? He said, I do. And he bowed his head and we prayed. And Amen. I can remember those tears falling from Bones' eyes, those, those real tears, yes. coursing over those tattooed tears of the world dropping onto the pages of my Bible. And when it was all done, I said, Bones, I said, that's great. He said, it is. We got back in line and Bones bought my lunch, bought my dinner. <laughs> Rule number one, witness to everybody at White Castle. <laughs> Went back home and went to bed and went to school the next day, and, and nothing had really changed. They had made fun and, and done their thing and pudding and, and all of that. I got myself ready for Mr. Harris's class, and, and I walked in, and God's honest truth, the Lord is my witness. When I walked into that classroom, it was arranged differently again. There were 30 or 40, 50 chairs maybe on the left side of the room and the stool in the middle, but instead of one chair, there were two. And Bones was sitting down in one of them. And he looked over at me and he just, he just, he, he just went like that. Just, that's how they, that's ghetto talk. He just went like that. <laughs> and what that meant was, hey, you're good, come sit down. I skipped over. <laughs> no, but, uh, <laughs> Man, I remember sitting down next to Bones, and Mr. Harris came in, and, and just like normal, he came running in, and he jumped on his chair, and he, he looked at the class, and, and he looked at me, and he saw Bones, and then he shut his mouth, because he was scared to death of Bones like everybody else in the school. I stood for God that year, and, and listen, soon two chairs was five and seven, and, and however many, but at the end of the school year, 40 classmates trusted Christ and three teachers trusted Christ. And, and hey, young people, you talk about being resolved. Are you resolved to stand for God? Don't miss it. You can get caught up in the story. I couldn't stand for God until I stood before God. The Bible says in the book of Kings about Elijah, he said, the Lord before whom I stand. See, a lot of people want to try to stand for God and, and they'll fall every time. But listen, what needs to happen tonight? You need to reach up. And God needs to reach down. And you need to have a night. And, and I don't know what kind of night you need to have. Maybe for some, it's a night of salvation. For some, it might be a night of surrender. Maybe it's time to clean out your life and throw your stick in the fire. For some of you, there's a place for you to stand. And you need to stand before God first. Hey, resolved, resolved to stand for Christ. Do you have a night that changed your life forever? Who art thou, my son? We have it on the outside, but what about deep on the inside? Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes? The altar's certainly open. You're welcome to come, but, and several are, but I wonder if there's anybody in the house tonight who would say this. Brother Judah, and I'll do my best to look. Whether you're coming or not, I got this question for you. Brother Judah, I need to have a night of salvation. Oh, I filled out the cards, I, but I don't have anything on the inside, Brother Judah. I want real salvation tonight, Brother Judah. I need to get saved. Is there anybody at all at the altar or in the crowd? Anybody at all like that? Would you raise your hand and let me see?